Hey guys, Will here. So by now, most of you guys have seen our first impressions video checking out the SimiCube Active Pedals. So what we're gonna be doing in today's video is giving you a more objective overview of what this product is like to own and drive with more long term. I put about 30 or 40 hours into these pedals now, so I've got a pretty good idea of what they're like to drive with across a wide variety of different types of vehicles. Now, because these pedals are so expensive, there's certainly a lot to consider if you're thinking about picking yourself up a set of these. So don't worry, we'll have you covered in today's video. But we're also gonna be taking a bit of a look at what we can expect from this kind of technology moving forward, what the advantages are of it, what exactly it adds to the overall driving experience, and hopefully give those of you who might not be in the market for this particular set of pedals an idea of what we might be able to expect from future cheaper products. So, let's dive in. Okay, so before we get started on today's video, there is some important context that you guys need to be aware of. Firstly, a big thank you to SimiCube for sending across these pedals for us to check out. Now, the arrangement is a little bit different from what we normally do here at Boosted Media. So they sent us one pedal and the base plate, which they said we could keep. Uh, and we obviously, we greatly appreciate that. They sent us a second pedal as well, the add-on kit, which they said we could keep for five weeks and then either send back at their expense or choose to purchase at a discount counted rate should we wish to do so. I'll let you know later on in today's video whether we did decide to purchase that second pedal or not, but I thought it was important to just be completely open and upfront with you guys about exactly the arrangement here. Now, as is always the case here at Boosted Media, pretty much everything that we get sent here for review these days is provided to us. So there's absolutely no kind of preferential treatment or anything like that going on behind the scenes. Uh, they don't get to see the video before you guys do, as is always the case. And everything that I'll be talking about in today's video is just purely my own opinions and my own observations. Now, if you do decide that you wanna pick up a set of these pedals or anything else that you see in our videos, there will be some links down in the description below. Those are an awesome way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you guys. And those links are just there for you to use if you find our content valuable and wanna see us keep on going into the future. So we really appreciate your support there. But let's get started here by talking about pricing. Now make sure you're sitting down for this. Uh, if you're not already aware, these are very, very, very expensive. So these pedals are designed so they can be used in conjunction with other pedals. So if you do decide you only wanna have the brake pedal, for example, Example, which would be the most logical uh, arrangement. I can't imagine why you want to use one of these as just a throttle or a clutch without having one as a brake pedal. What you can do is either plug your other two pedals in via USB directly to your PC, or if you have a set of Husingvelt Sprints Ultimates or Ultimate Pluses, you can actually buy an adapter cable and an adapter mounting plate from SimiCube to enable you to plug them directly into the back of your brake pedal, and that will allow you the full functionality through the SimiCube link box, which we'll be looking at later on today. So if you want to buy just a brake pedal, you're looking at 2000 1398.80 euro. Uh, two pedal set is 4425.60. A three pedal set is going to set you back 6392.40 euro. That pricing does include VAT. Now, there are a couple of resellers around the world as well. We'll have some links to some of our affiliate partners down below, as I mentioned earlier. But just make sure you do shop around, make sure you're getting the best price in your local area. Obviously, shipping and import duties can be absolutely monstrous. Now, SimiCube have just announced their own non active load self throttle pedal as well for pre-order, which comes in at 337.20 euro. This will allow you to adjust the pedal mapping and calibration all from the one piece of software, as well as matching the aesthetics of the active pedal quite nicely. So then if you want the SimiCube base plate, that is also gonna be another 192 euro on top of that as well. So let's take a deeper dive into the hardware side of things now. And I'm sure for those of you who aren't familiar with this product, you're wondering what the hell do these do to, uh, to cost so much money? So what we're looking at here is a a active pedal system. What they mean by that is the pedal itself can actually provide force feedback in a couple of different forms, as well as the ability to actually make adjustments to the pedal feel, and even the pedal adjustment and angle to a certain extent at least through software. So you're not having to go in, change elastomers, you can make quick adjustments between different vehicles if you want to. And it unlocks a whole lot of possibility when it comes to actually providing force feedback through the pedals. So in the pedal's current state, that gives us the ability to feel the sensation of ABS kicking in in our brake pedal or our engine vibration and traction control kicking in on any of the three pedals that we happen to have installed on our rig. So you can imagine for yourselves what kind of possibilities that unlocks in terms of you know bringing new information to the context of sim racing that we might not have felt before. And as I mentioned in our first impressions video, the two things that I believe are missing in sim racing up until now were a sensation of sustained g-force so that cornering g-force as you go around a long sweeping corner the other thing of course was the sensation of force feedback 
through the pedals. And that's what we now have at least in some form with the SimiCube Active Pedal. So that's the reason why this is such an exciting and such an expensive product. It's a new technology and no doubt, although the price is high now, we will see newer products coming out down the line, which will hopefully make this more accessible to more people. Because that is one thing that does disappoint me. Although I understand the reason why this is so expensive, I would like to see this technology being more accessible to more people. And there's not really any way around that. Um, you know, it's just prohibitively expensive at the moment. So I really do hope that we see that down the line. So in terms of the hardware itself, it looks very complicated sitting here on the desk, but it's actually quite simple in how it functions. So you've got a, well, it's simple in terms of the fundamentals of how it works, actually making this all work and react in real time without any latency or lag or slop in the pedal is actually a pretty amazing engineering feat. But we've got a actuator sitting on the front here, which rotates a ball screw type system. I think I called it a worm drive in the previous video, but it's actually a ball screw type arrangement. And if we have a look in through the window on the top, there's a little screw there that winds in and out very, very quickly. And as that happens, what it does is it pulls the pedal with it. So we've got a pivot down here at the base of the arm, which is connected to the uh, ball screw. And then we've got a bearing system down at the pivot points on each side, which allows that pedal to move through its stroke. Now, one thing that you will notice, and you can probably hear it right now if I shut up for a second, because you are physically connected to an electric motor, although it is remarkably smooth for what it is, there is still a little bit of underlying grain there. It almost feels like there's sand in the mechanism or something like that. Now, in my driving experience, I found on the brake pedal, it didn't really bother me too much. On the throttle, honestly, I didn't notice it after a couple of minutes of driving. When you sit down in the rig though and push down on the throttle and clutch pedal, it is definitely something that you'll notice until you get out and driving. And as I said in our first drive video, if I were judging any other set of pedals that didn't have this active mechanism in them, I would say that there was something wrong there and they needed to improve that. So look, unfortunately, it is just a byproduct of the design of these pedals. Uh, with a ball screw mechanism like what we have here, if they were to remove that feeling, if they were to loosen things up a little bit, you would end up with lash or movement in the pedal. And as you can see here with the pedal sitting firmly on the desk, there is absolutely no slop or play or movement in any direction, which of course you're gonna expect for the price point that we're paying here. But yeah, they, they do an absolutely fantastic job. One of the things that I was worried about is that there might be a little bit of movement or weirdness or even maybe a robotic feeling or some latency in the pedals. But uh, through the 30, 40 hours of driving that I've done on these pedals now, absolutely no issues with anything like that whatsoever. So at a fundamental level, that is how the force feedback part of these pedals work. And that is what also allows us to make those adjustments as we were saying before to the pedals without having to make any mechanical adjustments on the pedals. Now up in the arm here, you can see a little strain gauge or load cell. And the way that works is as we apply force to the face of the pedal, these two little lobes on the edges deflect slightly inwards. That deflection is then measured and outputted as a voltage, and that voltage is then interpreted in the sim as braking force or braking pressure inside the game. So essentially the way the braking force is interpreted is exactly the same as any other load cell. And if you configure one of these as a throttle or clutch pedal, it basically works exactly the same way. It's just using that signal as a position inside the sim rather than an amount of force being applied. I'm not sure whether they also interpret the position of the arm internally down here for the position for the clutch and the throttle, but either way, it all works perfectly smoothly. There's no issues with jumpiness or uh, lack of detail. Everything there works absolutely fine. So let's quickly run through now the different configurations and what you actually get inside the box. So if you order one of these, it's gonna come in a really nicely presented, I'm not exactly sure what material that is actually, but it's a nice little case, I guess you could call it, which is actually quite difficult to open. Uh, it's kind of like one of those iPhone boxes where you open it and everything goes flying. So you gotta be a little bit careful, but it is what it is. And then all the gear is just gonna be sitting inside here. So the pedal sits here, power supply is gonna sit here, uh, and you get the idea. It also includes a little uh, Torx key as well for making the mechanical adjustments, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, but yeah, all very, very nicely presented. Again, obviously, as you would expect for the price. And I'll quickly run you through what we actually get inside the box for each configuration. So if you're buying just the one pedal to use as a brake, you're going to get the little SimuCube link box, and that has an RJ45 connection on the back there, which is gonna connect through to the pedal, and then a USB-C connection, which you're gonna connect through to your PC. Now, SimuCube, of course, do already have their SimuCube 2 wheelbases that don't use this protocol at the moment, but I don't know whether maybe we might see a SimuCube 3 later on that uses something like this as well to get it all into the same ecosystem. So at the moment, you are running a different software package for these pedals to what you run for the SimuCube 2 wheelbases, in case you're wondering, but we'll show you the software a little bit later on today too. So you get the SimiCube link box. You of course get the power supply as well, which is a Meanwell power supply rated 
at uh, 48 volts DC. It is a switch mode power supply too, so you can connect it anywhere you are in the world just via the IEC cable connection. So at 100 volts to 200 volts AC, you're looking at a maximum wattage of 306 watts, or at 200 to 240 volts, you're looking at 360 watts or 7.5 amps maximum output. Now in terms of power consumption, in case you're wondering, these guys are gonna draw between about 10 watts to 100 watts under normal kind of driving conditions. So around about the same kind of power consumption you would expect from a mid to high end direct drive wheelbase, for example. So that has a little Molex style power connector on the back of it, exactly the same kind of connector as we see on the SimiCube 2 range, as well as the uh, DD1 and DD2 from Fnatic, in case you're wondering. That plugs into the back of the pedal. I'll show you that interface in just a minute. And that is the power supply. So then in addition to that, you also get a little box of mounting hardware, nice high quality uh, M5 bolts, stainless bolts, I believe as well. So yeah, nice high quality stuff, obviously again, as you would expect for the price, but no issues there in terms of quality. And then you also get an RJ45 network cable to connect between your SimiCube link and the back of the pedal. So let me just quickly spin this guy around for you so you get a better look at exactly what's going on here. So move it back so I can see as well. So we've got our power input here. We've got our SimiCube link port. Then we've got two pedal ports that allows us to connect through via that adapter cable that I mentioned earlier to Husingvelt Sprint uh, Ultimate or Ultimate Plus pedals if you wish to run those. We've got a little adapter port up here as well, which we don't know a whole lot about other than the fact that it uh, is gonna allow us to connect to additional accessories apparently in the future. So definitely stay tuned to find out what that's all about. And then we've got a daisy chain power output here as well, which allows us to connect through to additional pedals so that we don't have to connect multiple power supplies supplies for each pedal. And that's the reason why the power supply is rated quite a lot higher than the power consumption of each individual pedal. So that definitely makes things a little bit easier. Now, if we are gonna be connecting multiple pedals, it does get a little bit more complicated. So if you buy a two pedal set, a three pedal set, or an add-on pedal later on down the road, what you're gonna get is, uh, instead of the SimiCube link box, they're gonna include a little third party network hub like this guy, and that has its own little power supply as well, so you will need two power plugs if you're gonna be running more than one pedal. It also includes a little power daisy chain cable to link one pedal to the next one. If you buy a three pedal set, obviously you're gonna get two of these. And then what you basically do is you connect the hub to your SimiCube link box, and then you connect each pedal back in through the hub as well. So they're all connecting in parallel rather than a daisy chain like we see with some other network protocols like this guy. So yeah, it does look like quite a lot, but once you get it all set up on the rig, it is quite a clean and tidy install. So while we're on the subject of hooking things up, let's just talk quickly about mounting before we get into the hardware build quality and the mechanical adjustments that are available on the pedals. So as I mentioned before, optional accessory mounting plate, looking at around 200 euro just for the mounting plate. That is 570 millimeters long by 375 millimeters wide. Now I'll put up some mounting pattern uh, diagrams and things on the screen for you right now, rather than going through them all in detail, because there's detailed diagrams available on the SimiCube website. So we don't really need to go into all that detail. But what I will tell you is that you will want to allow probably an extra 20 to 30 centimeters off the back here, just to allow for cabling and things like that. So it is a very long pedal. I mean, the pedal itself measures, uh, what is it, 100 millimeters by 250 50 millimeters by 402 millimeters long. So if you have your existing sim rig up against a wall, you probably are gonna end up having to move it back a little bit. I'm sure that if you're investing in a set of pedals like this, then you're probably prepared to do something like that. You probably have space to move your rig around, but just be aware they are a lot bigger than your standard set of pedals. You guys can see that for yourselves anyway. And then we have a couple of little mounting channels. Those are spaced at 85 millimeters apart from side to side. Each channel is 33 millimeters long and the spacing between them is 120 millimeters. So you can actually hard mount these directly to an aluminum profile rig if you've got the ability to move things around. Obviously every rig is a little bit different so make sure you do your research there. But look, this, this mounting plate, although it is very expensive and I do really think that they should include it for free if you buy one of these pedals, it does make mounting very convenient. So you've got three thin profile channels that allow you to mount all three pedals or other pedals pedals if you wish to do so. You may just need to purchase additional mounting brackets to make that work. Uh, they do include all the T-nuts and bolts that you're gonna need to mount these pedals on as well. And then basically you just bolt this to whatever rig you happen to have. So you've got mounting holes in the center of each one of these aluminum profile rails. And that just bolts, in my case at least, it just bolted directly to my SimLab P1X cockpit that I run for my daily driver rig. And absolutely no issues. This thing is absolutely rock solid as well. So no issues with flex whatsoever. Again, as you would expect for the price. Uh, I'm not sure if it's 
aluminium or stainless steel. It's not picking up with the magnet, so it's definitely not, uh, if it is steel, it's stainless, but yeah, there's no magnetism there at all. So maybe it is aluminium, I'm not sure, but six millimeter thick on the side plates here and, uh, and three millimeter thick for the heel plate. And yeah, absolutely no issues with flex or anything like that, of course, as you would expect for the price. But yeah, it, it definitely did make mounting these things a lot easier. And I think if you're forking out for these pedals, then you, you're probably gonna want this base plate, let's be honest. So definitely no issues in terms of quality. That obviously allows you plenty of adjustment to move the pedals from side to side along those aluminum channels. And we can also raise and lower the front and rear of the heel plate as well if you wanna have that higher or lower or on a slight angle, depending on your particular installation. So let's set that guy back aside for now and let's dive in more detail and uh, take a look at the hardware itself, the build quality and some of those other mechanical adjustments. So starting with the adjustments, uh, you can see up the top here, we do have two little Torx screws. You saw the little uh, Torx key that we had in the box earlier. So you can loosen those off. That allows you to adjust the angle of the pedal itself. We also have two screws on the back here as well. That allows us to raise and lower the pedal pads. And then in here as well, we also have the ability to flip this mechanism upside down. Now in the upright position, like what we have it here, that gives us a maximum pedal force of 150 kilos with 62 millimeters of pedal travel. Uh, in the flipped upright position, that gives us 120 kilograms of pedal force uh, with a maximum range of 79 millimeters of travel. Now, look, I, I don't see why anybody would need 79 millimeters of travel, maybe on a clutch, but for the brake and the throttle, at least in my experience, there was absolutely no reason to need to make adjustments to these whatsoever. So that basically just means that all the adjustment that you're ever gonna need to do realistically is all just done within the software. And as I mentioned earlier, when you get up and do the calibration in the software, obviously you wanna try to have the rig set up ergonomically as, as good as you can from a, from a baseline perspective and then make any adjustments that you need to. So for example, if you need a little bit more angle on one of the pedals, maybe you wanna have your throttle pedal sit a little bit in front of or a little bit behind your brake pedal, uh, you can make those adjustments in the software. And it's just gonna jump into the position that you need. So it's as simple as that. Now look, in terms of build quality, I mean, you're gonna expect the absolute best of the best, no expense spared when you're paying this kind of money. Everything here, as you can see, is extremely high quality, even just down to the pedal face itself, which has got this nice dimple feeling. Now I did the majority of my driving actually with just thick socks on and had absolutely no issues using the pedals at all. I did drive in boots for at least a couple of hours though. And as you can see, the pedal faces themselves are still in as new condition. Obviously, if you've got rocks and things trapped in the sole of your shoes, it's gonna scratch these up. But yeah, beautiful anodized aluminum finish. And in fact, already there are some aftermarket pedal pads coming onto the market. So Simcor actually sent me across uh, their throttle and brake pedal to check out, which I haven't actually had an opportunity to do so yet, but we might start, we might check those out in a future video along with some of the other bits and pieces. Uh, it's been a while since we looked at SimCore stuff, so I'm keen to check them out again. But yeah, I think, uh, I think I saw hybrid racing simulations posted on Facebook that they had something available now too. So no doubt you'll see all kinds of options coming onto the market. But yeah, the OEM ones are absolutely fine as well. A bit of a non-conventional shape for a uh, throttle pedal pad, for example. I mean, I'm sure most people would be more used to seeing something more like that on a throttle pedal. So it would have been nice again for the price for them to include a couple of different options maybe like you see even you know Fanatec on some of their cheaper pedals include a few different options. So yeah, it is what it is, but again, no issues actually driving with the OEM ones. Just to give you a quick look internally here as well, I'm not gonna pull the whole mechanism apart. I'm absolutely terrified of things that might be spring loaded and I just don't wanna have an explosion of uh, thousands of dollars worth of parts here on the table. I don't think that would be very good. So <laughs> let's have a quick look at the PCB here. You can see a couple of things going on. Uh, firstly, uh, it is it is their own proprietary PCB. If you're not aware, SimiCube is actually owned by a parent company, Granite Devices, which are industrial experts when it comes to mechatronics, robotics, and things like that. So we would, of course, expect to see their own design. You can see there's a lot of brains and stuff going on here. There is an ARM processor sitting there. Unfortunately, I can't read the exact model of it because it's got a little piece of white out over it. That might be intentional to stop me from reading it out. I don't know. Uh, you can see a little braking resistor here as well to stop any overrun of the motor. And then we can see down here our power delivery. So this cable coming out of the top of our motor, that would be the encoder, I would imagine, which is feeding information back to the board. And then we've got our three phase power delivery here, which is running through a couple of little ferrite chokes and our earth 
running back to the chassis. So yeah, I'm not gonna pull it apart any further than this. You can see through the window on the top roughly how that internal mechanism works. But really, I think this is just all gonna be about the software and the driving experience. But I did wanna just have a quick look here and make sure there wasn't anything obvious. But I'm not seeing any hot glue anywhere. I'm seeing good quality connections everywhere. This entire assembly here is all aluminum as well. So there shouldn't be any issues with EMI. Uh, the little plate that sits over the top of it is also aluminum too. So that would keep all the electronics nicely shielded. And uh, yeah, look, it's as simple or as complicated as that really. So let's, uh, let's move on from the hardware now. Let's take a quick look at the software side of things now, and then we'll get in and do some driving. Okay, so we're not gonna go through absolutely everything when it comes to the software. I know most of you guys have already seen the first video that we did that was pretty comprehensive in looking at all the settings and what they do. I just wanna run you through, I guess, filling in the gaps in that original video and also explaining where I've landed with the settings that I use for my data to driving. Remembering that I've got about probably 30, 40 hours of uh, raw driving into these pedals now. So I've got a pretty good idea of what feels good to me subjectively. And what you're gonna see here is that all of this is extremely subjective. So really the value here is the ability to actually tweak and change things and really dial things in to make them your own. And I'll show you a couple of other notable drivers profiles as well, just to show you the differences between where I've landed and where they've landed. Also the differences between those two drivers as well to kind of highlight uh, what we're, the point that we're trying to make here. So let's start off with the throttle pedal here. And again, if you're not sure what any of these settings mean, how they work, go back and watch that original video where I kind of explained how all this stuff works. But what I've landed with here is a non-linear actual mechanical mapping here for the pedal. So remembering again, as we saw in the previous video, that we have our mapping here for how the pedal actually mechanically reacts underneath your foot. And then we have a second curve mapping down here which actually maps the response of the pedal in terms of what the load cell is actually sending through to your sim and how that signal is interpreted in the game. Now you'll notice here that I'm actually running a completely linear curve mapping here. I actually haven't found a lot of value and I did play around with this ex extensively. Um, in fiddling around with this, either for the brake or the throttle, because I find that you know the mechanical feel of the pedal underneath your foot kind of ends up ultimately stipulating what kind of signals are gonna be going through to the game. So if you've got a lot of mechanical resistance underneath your foot, obviously you're gonna to have to apply more force, which then if it tapers off is gonna result in a, you know, a non-linear response overall anyway, if that makes sense. Now I did speak to a couple of other drivers as well in the SimiCube Discord about this, and some of those guys were actually running non-linear response curves and absolutely swore by it. So again, very subjective here, but this is just what I've landed on. And you know, I'll try to explain to you the reasons why I've done things the way I have, so it makes sense to you guys. So yeah, I've got a bit of a non-linear response here or a bit of a non-linear feel underfoot which just allows me to get a little bit more sensation uh, where I can adapt my muscle memory and actually set muscle memory around the position of my throttle pedal. So I'm running a relatively low maximum force here. Obviously you don't wanna have your throttle pedal too stiff, otherwise it becomes more of an explosive muscle input rather than something that has finesse behind it. And that's probably gonna be a bit of a recurring theme throughout today's video, but you can see it's a little bit steeper on that initial input and then it tapers off as we get up to the higher. And that gives me just a little bit more control, a little bit more feeling in the pedal so I can feel exactly where I am. Now I've got the preload set at 3.16 kilos. That just means that there's a little bit of initial resistance to overcome, just so the pedal doesn't feel completely sloppy underfoot. And if I were to wind that down to zero, you can see now the pedal's just kind of, a kind of just a sloppy mess there. It doesn't have a lot of feeling to it. It doesn't get, really give you a lot of feedback. If I were to crank that up to 40 kilos, then it becomes <laughs> an explosive muscle input, which is just ridiculous. So that's more like what you would run on a brake pedal. So I'm gonna set that back to around three, yeah, three kilograms. Three to four kilograms is absolutely fine here for me. No issues at all. Now I'm also running my pedal travel quite high. Now that isn't the maximum amount of travel that is available on these pedals. As you would have seen, there is actually an angle adjustment as well. So if you increase the angle of the pedal, that will reduce the overall amount of throw available to you in the software here. But for me, I've got this set to around 50 to 55 millimeters. I like to have quite a bit of travel available in my throttle pedal, just to give me a little bit more control, a little bit more feeling of what's going on. Once again, the shorter you set this, obviously the less scope of movement you have, the less control you're gonna have with your throttle input. So again, it's a subjective thing, but for me, you know, up to a point at least, you don't wanna to have too long a travel, but of course, the longer the travel is, the longer it's gonna take your foot to get to the position that you actually want it to be in. So if you're driving something where, you know, getting that power down instantly is absolutely vital to a fast lap time, you can imagine that, you know, if it takes you a couple of milliseconds to actually get to 100% throttle, that is ultimately time that you're gonna be losing around the circuit. So it will be a balance and something that you're gonna to wanna to fiddle with around track, for the, depending on the car that you're driving and the track that you're driving, of course. If you've got a lot of really tight corners, you might wanna have a little 
little bit more sensitive. If you've got a lot of long sweeping corners, it's probably not gonna be quite so important. Now I'm running a little bit of dampening here as well, 21% on my dampening when pressed and 9.7% on release. So that just gives a little bit more sensation, again, kind of what I was talking about before to uh, establish a bit of muscle memory. Now look, honestly, the throttle pedals in modern day cars, street cars or race cars, most of them are uh, drive by wire anyway. And all it is really is just a spring attached to a paddle. So there isn't generally a lot of feeling in real life cars. So, you know, my, my philosophy here ultimately ended up being what do I find actually gives me the most sensation, the most feeling of control in the context of sim racing. And again, that's gonna be another thing that we're gonna be talking about today as well as, you know, whether you actually want to try and simulate the pedals as they feel exactly in a real life car or whether you wanna try and dial them in to feel what you think is gonna give you the best sensation for sim racing specifically. So I like to have a little bit of dampening on press there just to give me a little bit of a sensation of resistance against my foot and a little bit of, I guess, squishiness to the pedal again, just to aid in that muscle memory establishment. And then on release, I found that running a little bit of dampening just helped me to have a little bit more control and just filter out some of those little micro adjustments that I might be making on the pedal. So sometimes a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a accidental lift off might upset the car. It might remove the balance of the car forward or backwards, depending on the configuration of the car, whether it's front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, front engine, mid engine, or rear engine. Uh, but yeah, you can imagine that if you're making little tiny adjustments there, filtering those out a little bit can actually help. And that was the reason why I ended up landing there with my dampening. And if you go and watch uh, Daniel Murad's video where he went through the setup, he actually reached a pretty similar conclusion. I didn't actually watch that video until after I'd kind of already figured this out for myself. So it was actually quite interesting to see that he'd found a similar usage for this setting that I did. Now friction, I've left off. Look, honestly, friction is a bit of a mess at the moment in the software. This is something that I did actually report back to the guys at Simicube and they agreed with me that it needs a lot of fine tuning. So this allows you to have a little bit more friction in the pedal, obviously pretty self-explanatory. What I found is that uh, when I did implement these settings, it just, it led to erratic behavior basically. So the pedal would react differently under different scenarios and you know, even just between presses would feel completely different. And even just now, I'm feeling weird vibrations and weird kind of robotic movements in the pedal. To get the pedal initially moving feels quite awkward, but then the next time I press it, it might be completely smooth. And look, yeah, the friction setting, at least as it pertains to the throttle at the moment, is a complete mess. So I wouldn't recommend running that at all, but obviously that will be something that will be improved upon over time. We already talked about the input mapping. So at the moment, I've just got that set completely linear. And then we get down into our effects. So. I made a couple of fine tuning adjustments to how the effects actually feel, but in terms of what I run through the throttle pedal, I ended up leaving this pretty much the same as uh, what I had previously. So I've got a little bit of engine vibration or motor vibration here. That's just, just give me a little bit more, I guess, immersion in the game. It's not really adding anything of value in terms of my overall speed or consistency, but yeah, anything that adds a little bit of extra immersion is good in my book. So I'm running it relatively low. You can see my vibration intensity is only 8.4%. So I don't want it to be overpowering. I don't want it to be, you know, pulling my attention away from the things that are actually important to driving quickly and consistently. I don't want it to become superfluous noise, I suppose. It's just something that adds a little bit more sensation to the game. And then traction control, I did actually end up finding this to be quite useful. Uh, not necessarily in the way that I thought I would. What I found useful here was the ability to feel when the traction control was kicking in a little bit more vividly, I suppose, than what I would normally feel through the uh, D-Box motion system that I run on my rig. And what that allowed me to do was actually dull my uh, traction control in inside the game so that I wasn't losing additional lap time around the track. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is if you run your traction control too high in the sim, often you're running into throttle cut or uh, you know fuel cut as you're, as you're accelerating out of a corner. And even though you might not necessarily be braking traction, uh, without that traction control, it's costing you acceleration, it's costing you time around the lap. So what I was able to feel with this is when the traction control was kicking in, I guess, prematurely and being able to dial that back, wind it back to exactly the point where I needed it so that I was able to get maximum acceleration, maximum launch out of the corner, but without losing the back of the car. So those are kinds of things that you can feel in the sim through the steering and how things are reacting. Often we'll have a light on the dash as well that blinks when traction control is kicking in, but actually feeling it in my foot and being able to react to it with my throttle input, but also getting that sensation so I could go, okay, yeah, I'm running a little bit too much traction control here and dial it back was something that I did genuinely find uh, improve my lap times and my consistency. So that's the reason why I'm running that. But again, I don't wanna have it so high that it's completely overpowering. So that was the usage that I ended up finding for the traction control setting. And that is pretty much everything in terms of throttle mapping. We'll come back 
to here in a moment once we've gone through the break and show you some of the other guys' uh, maps that they've done here as well so you can see just how different they like it to how I like it to give you a sense of just how subjective this is once again. But let's jump into the brake pedal now and have a look at how I've got this set up. Remembering this is my configuration that I use for GT3, GT4, and then I make a few different adjustments if I'm driving a street car or a Formula style car with a shorter pedal travel. So we'll run through all that stuff. Hopefully this will all make sense to you. So as we saw in the previous video, once again, we can adjust where our maximum 100% game input level would be relative to our force curve. We can adjust the maximum amount of force necessary to reach 100% deflection. We can adjust our preload, and then we can also adjust the pedal travel here to remembering again that our angle adjustment will stipulate how much range of movement we have available here, but I can't see anybody really needing more than 55 mil of uh, travel for a brake pedal. I just think that anything more than that is gonna start to get a little bit crazy. So let's, let's break this down. So I've got a initial pretty linear curve as I get to my threshold point. And then as you've seen me explain in a lot of other videos previously, and there's a specific video that I did explaining how I like to set up a load cell brake pedal or a hydraulic brake pedal. And I suggest you watch that to get a better understanding of the reasons why this, uh, this works for the context of sim racing, at least in my opinion. And quite a few people found that video quite useful. So I'll link it down in the description below for you guys. But yeah, basically what's happening here is I'm pushing the pedal down to my threshold point. And my threshold point is where I ramp this up. So what I'm feeling is, what I'm creating here is basically a second stage in my braking. So I've got that initial push in the pedal, and then I reach that clearly defined threshold point where the pedal feels like it's starting to stop underneath my foot. And the idea here is that it gives me a nice clearly defined point in the pedal stroke where I can hit consistently with muscle memory. So you can see for me, hitting that point should sit at around about 80% braking pressure. It's gonna vary a little bit because of how sensitive things are in general, but if I can hit that 80% brake pressure point consistently, then that works really well for me in iRacing. If I'm driving a car or a sim where I actually wanna be hitting 100% brake pressure instead of 80% at my threshold point, all I do is I just wind this down, and I've got a separate profile set up for ACC to achieve this. I just wind that down to the point where I'd be hitting 100 or 80%, which is about 70 kilograms of force. And now when I hit that pressure point, you can see I'm sitting at around about 100% input, and then I can modulate around that as necessary. So I did spend many, many hours fiddling around with this. This is what I found worked best for me. As a sim racer, I'm not trying to simulate exactly what any particular car feels like in real life, just trying to give myself the information that I feel is most pertinent to driving quickly and consistently. So that's what I've done. Now the variations of this would be if I'm driving a F1 car, for example, I might actually decrease that travel even a little bit more down to around 15 mil. And that just makes the pedal that little bit stiffer, but it doesn't change the overall characteristics of the pedal. And that's important because we don't wanna be completely resetting our muscle memory between all the different types of cars that we drive. Now in real life, again, of course, different cars are gonna feel different, but real life racing drivers generally at least aren't gonna be jumping and changing between lots of different types of cars, you know, from day to day or week to week, like what we do in sim racing. So for me, this kind of makes the most sense. It still has the basic same characteristics underfoot, but it just feels a little bit more realistic with that lower travel. And then again, if I'm driving something like a street car, I wind this up to around 40 mil. And that just gives me a longer pedal stroke. So you can see I have to push the pedal mechanically further to reach that threshold point. But once I get there, again, it still feels roughly the same underfoot. So it's giving me that slightly more authentic feeling, but not completely screwing with my muscle memory. And you can see here, I've got my curve maximum force set to 86 kilos. This is just purely gonna be based on how strong you are in your legs. I've been skipping leg day uh, pretty much my entire life, so I don't have this uh, I don't have this set super, super strong. But um, you know, I am starting to do a little bit more cycling now, and I'm already finding that so, you know, I'm needing to increase it little by little. And uh, if you go back and watch some of my videos from a couple of months ago, I was running at around sort of like 70 kilograms of force. So it does vary depending on how strong you are. And you'll see that in just a minute when we have a look at Heike Kovalainen's F1 profile, which is absolutely crazy. Easy, at least in my opinion, but that's what he says feels good to him. So if we scroll down here, uh, we can see our dampening setting. What that does is again, just help filter out those little micro adjustments that I might be making unintentionally. And it gives a slightly more hydraulic feeling to the pedal as well. Makes it feel like it's actually, I guess, connected into a system rather than just being a standalone piece of equipment. So yeah, that, that was where I landed with there. Again, you might wanna run more, you might wanna run less, but I definitely found it was beneficial 
to have it turned on for me at least. Friction, same deal as with the throttle pedal, maybe not quite so bad here, but I just didn't find that it did anything of value at all, so I've left that off. And again, with my, uh, with my simulator input mapping, I'm just running a completely linear curve, but that's definitely something I would recommend. Play around with it, see what feels good to you. Uh, I'm sure Dan Suzuki will be coming out with a review video very soon as well, if he hasn't already had one out by the time this video goes live. And I know that he's somebody that runs non-linear curves here, so it'll be really interesting to see what his take is on all of this. Then we get down into effects. And as I said in the original video, uh, it did end up being the case. I did experiment around with this and I found that uh, only running ABS, not having the motor vibration and traction control turned on was, uh, was where I landed. Now, of course, as you saw earlier, I am running motor vibration and traction control on the throttle, but I found that having them separated just gave me that little bit more sensation of what was going on. And it sort of, it didn't have quite such an effect of muddying the, uh, the sensation of ABS. Now, the important thing to understand here with these effects as they pertain to the brake pedal, particularly with ABS, is that this is essentially a, uh, well, it's not really even a canned effect. It's an effect that you're generating through these settings here that basically just kicks in whenever the ABS is present in the sim. So the telemetry data is basically saying ABS is activated or ABS is not activated. It's not actually sending out a signal which varies the feeling of the pedal underfoot re relating directly to the telemetry of the game. So it's not gonna simulate things like brake fade, for example. And that's something that we'll discuss a little bit later on in today's video in our conclusions, because that's definitely an area where I think there's a lot of potential in these pedals in a mechanical sense that isn't realized yet in the software. And that is of course limited by the fact that the sim titles that we have at the moment don't output that kind of data. So it's impossible for them to do it. But over time, I'm sure we will see that kind of thing implemented. So yeah, the point that I'm trying to make here is that what you're doing is you're essentially creating your own effect here. So we've got a range between five Hertz and 25 Hertz. So that's just the frequency of the vibration. You've then got a smoothness adjustment here, which kind of just takes off that robotic edge. So I am actually running that quite high just to give me a little bit smoother of an effect and then just an intensity or amplitude adjustment here. So again, I don't wanna have this absolutely crazy high and I do find that if I'm learning a new track, I'll wind it up a little bit. And then once I'm familiar with the track and I'm happy with my progress, I'll wind it down again. And I'll explain exactly how I use this setting when we get up and driving a little bit later on because I, I have actually found this to be very, very beneficial. But at this point, I just wanted you to understand that difference between it actually just reacting to exactly what the sim is doing and how it's actually simulating you know, things like brake temperature, fluid temperature, pad wear, all those important things, as opposed to just generating an effect and being able to tweak the effect in here. So that is all the adjustments that I've made with the brake pedal. Now we should also talk about using this guy as a clutch pedal. And I did experiment with that as well. And look, I mean, I think you can probably imagine how this, how all these settings can be useful for the context of a clutch pedal. So for example, what I would do is uh, have a bit of a bump like that in my response curve. So when I'm pushing the pedal down, I get that second stage of release in the pedal. So you feel that kind of rollover point in the clutch pedal, but you can set this up to feel however you want really. And then of course you would map your, and this is where I can actually see the uh, curve mapping would be more, more useful. I would wanna make sure that my mapping for where my bite point is matches that rollover point or that friction point in the pedal. So we'd just make whatever adjustments we wanted to. So we'd probably set it to be quite flat like this so that I've got more scope of input around that area that I'm feeling the mechanical rollover point. But again, it's gonna be completely different depending on what type of car you're driving and how you actually like to have the pedal feel underfoot. And you know, the point here is that you have the ability to tune this and make it feel like whatever you want, unlike any other pedal that I've ever tested before. There have been some where I've been able to, you know, choose between a more clearly defined rollover or friction point or just having a linear input, but this this is far and beyond anything that I've ever tested before. Whether or not that's gonna be valuable enough to you to justify spending the money for a third pedal, I can't really advise you on that. All I can say is that, you know, there's a massive amount of adjustment available here. So if you are somebody that is, you know, constantly driving different types of car and wants to have that authentic feel in the clutch pedal, this is definitely gonna achieve that for you. If it's worth it for you, that's up to you to decide. Okay, now I promised you that I would show you some other notable drivers profiles here as well, just to give you a sense of how subjective everything is. So again, have a quick look here. This was my brake profile and I explained to you the reasons why I set it up the way I did. Let's load now Heiki Kovalainen's uh, profile, which he has set up based off how a real life F1 car feels. Now I explained to you before, 
my approach was setting up what I felt was the most conducive to actually driving consistently uh, in a sim racing context. This is a completely different approach. He's just trying to make this feel authentic to a real life F1 car. Remembering again that in a real life car, you have the uh, you have the sensation of G-force under braking, of course, which does also assist how hard you can push on a brake pedal too. So a couple of things you're gonna note, well, a lot of things you're gonna notice here straight away. Totally different curve to what I had. He doesn't have that second stage thing going on. He doesn't have any sort of real clear defined threshold point that is allowing him to feel exactly how much brake pressure he's putting in to the pedal. You'll also notice that he's running a very short amount of throw here, but probably most importantly, 127 kilograms of force required to actually get to 100% braking force inside the game. Now, interestingly as well, you can see the way he's got this set up is even if you push to as hard as you can, it never actually goes past 83% input inside the game. So obviously he's trying to limit how much, well I, I say obviously, I guess what he's trying to do here is uh, limit how much he's able to lock up the tires under braking. So interesting, again, this is this is the approach taken by a real life F1 driver, completely different from what I had. And obviously what he's doing here is he's basically simulating being able to modulate completely just around the amount of force that's being applied to the pedal rather than any sort of position-based muscle memory whatsoever. And then having a really, really short throw on the pedal as well to assist with that. Now this is a similar amount of throw to what I run when I'm running for a Formula One style car. But again, just not having that second stage. Yeah, I, I really, I, I did do a bit of driving with this profile and I really struggled with it. Even, even if I lowered the force to a force which was uh, more well matched to my physique. I, I still just struggled to really get any feeling in the pedal, but that's the way he says it is. Now, if we also have a look at Daniel Murad's GT3 profile, here we go, Muradness GT3. Now, again, it's interesting that he's gone with a pretty linear pedal map compared to me. Now, Daniel, of course, in addition to his success in real life racing is also quite an accomplished uh, sim racer as well, and he also does a lot of driver training for sim racers. So I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly not saying that my profile or my approach is better than his, but again, like I actually really struggled with this profile. It's a very linear profile compared to mine once again, and he's got a lot more travel. As you can see, he's got 54.9 millimeters of travel uh, in that brake pedal, which surprised me. But again, he doesn't really have any point throughout the pedal stroke where there's a clearly defined pressure point that he can hit consistently and then modulate around. So yeah, I find that really interesting. Also interesting is the fact that he's running quite a low maximum force here as well. So the pedal isn't really fighting against you particularly aggressively. And to me, compared to the race cars that I have driven, it actually feels more like a, like a long pedal kind of sensation. So you never, you can push all the way to the end and get to 100% input before you actually feel any sort of hard stop that you can modulate around. So yeah, again, it's a really interesting take here. And, you know, I think it's fantastic that we have these real life drivers with that real life experience that are able to weigh in and, you know, share how they like to set things up. So yeah, I thought that was fascinating. Completely different again to what I would like, but I wanted to show you these things, um, you know, not to, not to say one is better than the other or to say you should do it my way or you should do it his way. I think the point here is that this illustrates just how subjective all of this stuff is. And there's no other pedal set that I've ever tested on the market that is able to achieve all the different types of setups that we have available that we can do here. So I think, you know, if you're, again, if you're the sort of person that's changing between lots of different styles of cars, uh, you may want to take a similar approach to what I did and just kind of adapt the overall travel in the pedal, but not adapt the sensation so that you don't interfere with that muscle memory. But if you want to be able to, you know, create an authentic feel for each of the different cars that you're driving, then you do have the ability to do that with these pedals as well. And that's something that I think is really special and unique about these. So I wanted to cover it in today's video, but let's jump in now and uh, talk about the driving experience now with 30 or 40 hours of experience under my belt. Okay, so to summarize the experience using these pedals. Now I've been tossing around in my head for a number of weeks now since we did that initial reaction video, trying to figure out the best way to approach this review. This is easily the most difficult review I think we've ever shot here simply because there's there's just so much variance in the experience with this product, you know, depending on how you want to use it 
and you know it's it's got so much potential into the future as well. What we're what we're seeing in the experience that we're getting with this product right now isn't really, I guess, indicative of the potential that this has overall as things flesh out over time. Now, there are a couple of things that need to happen for that to really, I guess, uh, come to fruition. So the first thing is that sim racing titles need to fully take advantage of adaptive pedals. So for example, like we discussed earlier, things like you know actually feeling the sensation of brake fade in the pedal and having having the pedal actually react to what is to the changes that are taking place inside the car. At the moment, what we have here in terms of the force feedback, at least, is purely just an effects-based system, which is taking a pretty digital kind of output from the sim. So it's just like, is ABS, is traction control on or off? And if so, either put on effect or don't put on effect, and then gives you the ability to fine tune that effect to feel like whatever you want it to feel. But if we could really dial it in to actually feel exactly like what the car is replicating, that would be amazing. Obviously the telemetry just isn't there right now. But I think the biggest thing there, and I think probably what I'm most disappointed about at this point in time, is that we don't have the sensation of things like brake fade, because the hardware is capable of doing it, the sim racing titles just don't have the telemetry there to actually allow that to happen. And until they do, it's not gonna be something that's possible for, uh, for Simicube to implement, or any other manufacturer that's looking at doing something similar to this. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you're driving a real life car on a circuit, things change over time, your pads wear down, your brake fluid gets warmer and warmer, and often if you're driving a street car on the track, for example, at a track day, uh, you might actually end up boiling your uh, boiling your brake fluid and then it ends up just being, you know, a pedal to the ground kind of scenario where you just lose that sensation in the brake. And you'll often hear real life race drivers refer to what's known as a long pedal, where, you know, changes that are taking place in the real life race car in real time are affecting the sensation that you're actually getting through the pedal. Now, the importance of that in the context of sim racing is that as changes take place mechanically and physically on the car, so as the brake pads wear down or the uh, temperature of the brake fluid increases, those characteristics will be felt through the pedal in a real life race car. So the driver is able to actually adapt to that and modulate their braking around those sensations. Now in the sim, because we're again limited to the telemetry that the sim is outputting, we're still getting that consistent brake feel as it's configured through the Simicube tuning software rather than the game actually telling the pedal what it should feel like. And I think that's really where the next, where the next phase in this technology will go is when the sim racing titles can actually adapt the feeling of the pedal in real time. So yeah, I would be lying if I didn't say that I was a little bit disappointed that we don't have that yet. I wasn't expecting to have it. I wasn't sure exactly what to expect going into this. But that said, the effects that we do have, particularly that ABS is extremely good. And that, that first reaction that I had to it was absolutely genuine. I wasn't bunging that on or anything on camera for you guys. That was genuinely, you know, my raw experience of experiencing a new technology for the very first time. And look, since, since that time, I've, as I said, put about 30, 40 hours of driving. I've been using these pedals on my daily driver rig now for four or five weeks, just really putting them through their paces, using them for all my online racing, everything, driving through a variety of different scenarios, different cars. And I think where I've landed in terms of the driving experience is that I don't think that these pedals are gonna make you any faster or more consistent in a car that doesn't have ABS. I just, I, I think it's just purely down to being able to fine tune the pedals to feel the way you like. In terms of actually giving you the raw feedback you need to drive more quickly and more consistently, the only real scenario where I found that to be massively beneficial was just with that ABS effect. Now you guys saw in that initial driving video that I was able to shave quite a significant amount of time off my lap times just by feeling where that ABS threshold was and being able to back off the pedal a little bit. And that has been consistent. I have found that my driving overall has been faster and more consistent using these pedals, but anything that doesn't have ABS, I haven't had that advantage. And in particular where I've really found that that has stood out has been tracks that have a lot of undulation or a lot of sweeping corners where there's actually you know a, a, a big camber on the circuit so say uh the the corkscrew through laguna seca for example or bathurst coming down through the chase is a really good example what i found was coming down the mountain in the gt4 car i was able to sort of ride the brake and modulate my uh modulate my input purely based off the sensation of the ABS kicking in and just keeping it just underneath that threshold. And that actually was able to gain me about a second just coming down that hill over what I was able to do previously. So the extra feedback is definitely useful there. But the important thing to understand there as well is that I am the sort of person that uh, jumps between a lot of different cars all the time. I'm obviously trying to vary the content as much as I can too with our race videos. So I'm not always just training on one car and one track for a week and then moving to the next thing. And I think that, 
definitely the the benefits that I was feeling using these pedals was primarily because it was giving me that sensation, being able to sort of feel what was going on with the car a little bit more. I think that if you're a person that's training on a specific car and track specifically for an extended period of time and really kind of dialing things in, you're probably not gonna feel the benefit that I felt in that regard. And the reason for that, I think at least, is that you're gonna get so dialed into what you're doing that you're gonna overcome those challenges and you're gonna, you're gonna end up figuring out what's faster and what's more consistent anyway. And I think that's probably part of the reason why we see so many highly successful esports drivers doing so well on relatively entry-level equipment is because you know when you're training in that manner you don't necessarily need that sensation of feedback like you do if you're chopping and changing between cars all the time so that's kind of where i've landed on it and how i explain the experience i'm really interested to hear what you think about that as well particularly people that have bought these pedals please do comment down below and let us know what your experience has been like so yeah if i'm chopping and changing between cars all the time Absolutely, these have made me faster and more consistent, no question about it whatsoever. But if you're really, really familiar with a car and track combination, I don't think that you're gonna ultimately be faster with these pedals. So I really am looking forward to seeing where this technology goes over time, but I would definitely say that it's a technology that's in its infancy at the moment. And you know, you're not gonna be getting the full experience now that you could necessarily be getting into the future if you invest in these pedals now. So you know, if, if this is a big financial stretch for you, then my recommendation there would be maybe just wait a little bit, see what else comes out on the market and see how the technology evolves over time. I know a lot of people probably see this product as a bit of a pay to win cheat code. And I know a lot of people will be investing the money expecting to instantly be a lot faster. And I, I know, I understand and I appreciate that my initial impression video probably contributed to that as well. So I wanted to make absolutely sure that you guys have the full picture. I, I was very clear in that video that it was a first impression and not a review, but I know that people look at it and uh, you know, that's the impression that they take away. So I wanted to, I wanted to sort of spend some time, I guess, explaining that in a little bit more detail so you have the full context and how I feel about it over an extended period of time. Now I mentioned earlier as well, a similar kind of outcome with the traction control as well. It was, uh, you know, having that effect in the pedal allowed me to dial in my traction control cut a little bit better to make sure that I was maximizing my corner exits. That did save me a little bit of time again, but once again, exactly the same as with the ABS effect. Um, you know, when, once you really dialed in with a car and track combination, you'd end up ultimately arriving at the same place most likely anyway. So I don't think it's a big long-term advantage there. Again, it's just if you're changing between cars frequently, you might find a little bit more time on track more quickly with those extra effects. But the big thing that I think we really need to uh, explore further in a future video here is just how close we can get the experience as it stands right now using tactile transducers. That's definitely something that I'm gonna be playing around with. And uh, yeah, I think again, if this is a huge financial investment for you, then I would definitely wait around and see what we're able to achieve with that as well because the pedal isn't actually reacting to what the sim is doing in terms of the overall feel. All it's doing is just generating an effect based on what the telemetry is telling it to do. And in theory, at least, in terms of just giving you some sort of a tactile cue as to what the car's doing, whether it be ABS or traction control or engine vibration, Theoretically, that could also be achieved with the tactile transducer at a much, much, much lower price point. So I think that's something that we definitely need to unpack further in future videos if you guys are interested, of course. So let us know in the comments down below. Now, there are a couple of other important things to be aware of too. Uh, again, I mentioned these in my initial impressions video, but the pedals do have a underlying sense of, I guess, I don't know whether I call it's, it, it almost feels like there's sand in the mechanism It's probably the best way I could describe it. So it's got this slight graininess to it. And that is simply just a result of the ball screw mechanism that we were taking a bit of a look at earlier. You know, that has to have a certain amount of tension on it. Otherwise you end up with lash and the pedals move around, particularly on change of direction with the force feedback. If you're, if you change your direction quickly, you would feel a little bit of lash or movement. If you remember back to my reviews of Next Level Racing Seat Mover, that's a good example. That seat had a quite a bit of movement in it or lash in the gear set just to, uh, you know, to allow it to do the things that it needs to do. So it's a bit of a trade-off there. Now, in the wider context of driving over time, I don't notice it. So like when I first sit down in the rig and I push the pedals down when I'm not driving, I definitely do feel that graininess there in both pedals, but more particularly in the throttle pedal because you're not sort of, you know, it's just a linear action rather than something that's, you know, giving you a lot of sensation anyway. So in the absence of a lot of other things going on, you do definitely notice that grain. And you can hear on, you can hear on the microphone as well, it is quite noisy compared to other pedals, 
But I did say in my initial impressions video that if I was reviewing another set of non-active pedals and they felt that grainy underfoot, uh, you know, without a reason to be that way, then, uh, then I would definitely complain about it. And that unfortunately hasn't changed. I was wondering whether maybe it might loosen up over time, but it does still feel exactly the same as it did in my initial impressions video. So if that's something that is gonna bother you, then that is definitely a consideration. I don't really notice it on the brake, to be honest with you, but on the throttle, definitely, if you don't like to have that underpinning texture, then then, uh, then that may be a, uh, an important consideration for you. So just be aware of that. You do of course have the ability to run non-active pedals in conjunction with these provided that they're compatible or just plug them into a separate uh, USB port on your PC as well. So you don't have to have the uh, throttle pedal from SimiCube if you don't want to. So we've talked at length now about the effects and forced feedback side of things. The other big advantage of these pedals is the ability obviously to make changes on the fly to how the pedals feel and adapt them through a massive variety of different types of feelings depending on the type of car you're driving and of course your own personal preference and you guys have hopefully seen communicating in this video just how much is possible there now i know one of the big questions that a lot of people are going to have is did i end up buying the second pedal i said at the start of the video that uh, they'd sent me one pedal uh, free of charge to review they also sent me the second pedal to do the review and uh, i had to decide whether i wanted to purchase that pedal or, uh, or send it back at the end of the uh, at the end of the time, and they were going to pay for the shipping back, so I wasn't going to incur any cost there. Now I have decided to hold on to the second pedal. Uh, you guys do need to be aware that I did get a discount on that purchase price, and I also didn't have to pay any shipping or import duties because I already had it here from the review. So it did ultimately end up being significantly cheaper than what I would have paid at retail. So you guys do need to be aware of that. Now the reason why I chose to purchase the second pedal wasn't actually because of the force feedback effects. I feel like they're only really of high value when it comes to the brake pedal. We talked about the traction control thing, but I, I, I just feel like that could probably be achieved quite easily with a tactile transducer. I don't really feel like it's something that is validating spending this much money on an extra pedal. The reason why I bought the second pedal was purely just down to two reasons. So. I wanna see how this technology evolves over time and the best way to do that is to actually have access to the pedals here. Uh, you know, we are a business, we do operate as a business and I kinda of saw it as a business expense. I'm a technology geek, I love this kind of technology and I just kinda of wanted to, I guess, experience it over time and see how it evolves. So that was a big, uh, a big reason for making that decision and not really a reason that I think um, is probably valid for a lot of you guys out there. So I don't want you guys to sort of think, well, he bought it, so therefore I should as well. Uh, the other reason as well was simply because as I mentioned earlier, I am chopping and changing between different types of cars all the time and having the ability to change that even just on a throttle pedal or even a clutch pedal, um, was definitely valuable and I'm still deciding whether I'm actually gonna go ahead and buy the third pedal as well just to use as the clutch. I think probably where I'll end up here is actually using the active pedals as the brake and clutch and maybe going with a more conventional pedal for the throttle. But I guess we'll just have to see what we end up doing there. Again, it is very specific to what I'm driving. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of GT3, GT4 and formula style, so I don't actually need the three pedals. But when I start doing a little bit more drifting on the channel, which is something I'm planning on doing, I'll probably end up configuring it in that manner. But yeah, for me at the end of the day, the reason why I made that decision was more down to the adjustability rather than the actual force feedback, which may surprise some people. But um, yeah, look, after using them for the number of hours that I have and driving the number of different cars that I've driven, that is where I've uh, really, I guess, fallen in love with them more than the force feedback side of things. But I also wanna see how that evolves over time as well. So the last thing I wanna talk about here as we wrap things up is, I guess, a more controversial topic. And that is, do these kinds of products make sim racing pay to win? Now, we've kind of already talked about this a little bit. And my conclusion there is that I don't think that in their current state, these pedals are really giving you anything that you couldn't achieve over time with lots of practice and training on any specific car and track combination. So I don't think that people that have these pedals necessarily have a significant unfair advantage, but we also do have to address the fact that there is a lot of potential in these pedals that's unrealized at this point in time. And look, thinking about how these could potentially be used in the future, there is of course always the possibility of having something like a real-time traction circle type thing where the pedals actually restrict movement and actually force you to not put in too much throttle or too much braking pressure as you're coming out of a corner. You know, there's all kinds of tricks and things that you could potentially do to 
I guess, better take advantage of the mechanical abilities of these products. I mean, there are other ways of setting up brake pedals to cheat, so to speak. I mean, you can you can set it so that you only ever reach 80% braking pressure, like what we saw in Heike Kovalainen's profile for Formula One, for example, to ensure that you never lock up a brake in the sim and things like that. And those are the kinds of things that esports professionals will do. Obviously, they want to have every single possible advantage. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with doing that. It's not really cheating. It's just making the absolute most of the technology that you have available to you. But one of the big challenges that we have in sim racing is that we can't control most of the time, at least outside of official competitions, exactly what equipment people are using and you know racing each other with. So there is always the potential of an unfair advantage there, but I don't think that you're gonna find that the people that own these pedals are just gonna dominate every single online race. So I, I don't think that it's a problem in that sense now. But again, that's something that we'll just have to see how it progresses over time. So to summarize overall, I think that these are an absolutely fantastic product from the quality of the engineering, the build quality, all the way through to the driving experience. There really isn't a whole lot to fault here other than just that sensation of graininess, which is just unavoidable with this kind of design. And it may, may or may not bother you. As I said, once I'm actually in and driving, I don't really notice it. But if I just sit down in the rig, I definitely do notice it. But look, I mean, they are an extremely expensive product. They're prohibitively expensive for the majority of people, let's be honest. And uh, you know, it, it, it is a shame that they're so expensive. I can understand why they're so expensive when you consider the amount of you know, design and development that's gone into this, both on the software side as well as the hardware side. But ultimately, we will, of course, see this technology trickle down into cheaper products. So to wrap things up, guys, yes, they are absolutely fantastic pedals. They're easily the best pedals that I've ever used. If you're in a uh, if you're in a financial position where you can comfortably afford them, then yeah, I think they're I think they're a worthwhile purchase, and uh, I definitely don't think that you're going to be disappointed with them. Should you be stretching yourself financially to purchase something like this, absolutely not. They're you know they're they're beyond the point of diminishing return. I would say while they do bring new and interesting things to the scene, and you know while that raw reaction that I had in that first video was absolutely genuine. The price that you're paying for that is absolutely massive as well. So I think I'm glad that this uh, I'm glad that this product exists, but I'm also very very excited to see where this technology goes in the future. Not only in terms of how this particular product evolves, but what other products we see down the pipeline that might make this kind of technology a bit more affordable for uh, for the majority of sim racers. Because this is just you know, the price point here, in, and I understand why it's so expensive. I'm not necessarily suggesting that it should be cheaper, but it, it is prohibitively expensive for the majority of people. So it would be irresponsible for me to sit here and say, hey, yeah, guys, you absolutely need to go and buy this. It's just it's just simply not the case. So I really do hope that this little video series has helped you guys out. As I said, we will also be doing some experimentation with some tactile transducers on other pedals as well to see just how close we can get that experience. Because I feel like the similar kind of value, at least in terms of the feedback that you're getting to make you faster and more consistent is also achievable on much more uh, on much more simpler setups and cheaper setups. So we're definitely gonna do some more experimentation with that. So subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on those videos. Of course, we have a whole bunch of other review videos coming up soon. As always, if you do decide you wanna pick up a set of these pedals or any of the other products that you've seen in today's video, we do have some links down in the description below, which are an absolutely awesome way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you guys if you find value in what we do. So there's absolutely no obligation to do that, but obviously what we do does take a lot of work and uh, that is what keeps us going. So I really do appreciate your support there. But above all, thank you very much as always for watching the video. Leave a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it and I will see you again soon. Bye.